move on to a third speaker. Um, it's Andrew Gwynn, also uh, from uh, the University of Oxford. He's a, a postdoc there in the uh, Oxford Center for Human Brain Activity, headed by Kier Nova and Mark Woolrich. And Andrew is going to talk about uh, well a very uh, similar topic. So it's delineating single subject oscillatory brain networks with uh, spatial spectral eigenmodes. Uh, go ahead, Andrew. Thank you, Christoph, and uh, thank you to Catherine Arena for some excellent talks um, earlier in this session. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to be talking about um, oscillations as well, but also in the context of brain networks, as opposed to uh, as opposed to single burst events. So often we might do an analysis looking at what's happening in a, in a brain region or a set of brain regions, as Catherine Arena have suggested, but here we're going to be looking at how uh, different regions might interact over an entire brain. Um, so this talk is based on a preprint we've had online that you can find uh, at this DOI. Uh, it's got the same title as the talk. And the tools are all based in a software package, which we've called Sales, which you can find online as well. We posted those links up on the Twitter as well, if anyone's interested to take a closer look. So the main issue I would like to get after today is how can we tackle both spectral and spatial variability in oscillatory brain networks at the same time? If we take space first, this paper gives us an example of four brain networks using a seed-based correlation. And even though the seed and the frequency bands are the same, you can see that the network of areas correlated with this seed across the four participants are really quite different. If we were to impose some structure on this and maybe say, okay, I, I assume that the network looks like maybe this fourth participant, then we might do a good job representing a couple of these other participants, but really we're going to be quite distorting to the networks and participants one and two. So really we, we'd like to be able to characterize each of these on a kind of bespoke individual basis. Unfortunately, there's, this isn't the only source of variability across participants. If we look at something as simple as a power spectrum, so here we have four alpha power spectra taken at rest uh, from a different paper, so these are different participants. We can see that all four participants do have a good candidate alpha peak but the shape of that peak and the peak frequency are also quite variable. So we'd really like to be able to represent each of these uh, on their own terms, but, but quite often we do have to impose some structure to do a group analysis. So for instance, if we were to impose say an eight to 12 Hertz alpha band here, we might do a good job of representing the information in A, but the lower band of our eight to 12 Hertz um, alpha range is gonna cut off B. So we're going to distort something in the second participant. So the big challenge is then how to do something about both of these together. So I'm going to present a method we've come up with based on autoregressive models, which allows us to characterize both the spatial structure and the spectral structure of a set of brain networks. So an autoregressive model is, uh, has some potentially scary looking maths, but the concept is very straightforward. That we're going to model what's happening at a particular time point as a linear summation of previous time points in that same time series. And these A uh, parameters are then just regression coefficients relating the past history of a time series to what's going to happen in its future. Quite often, once we've got these A parameters, we can get a power spectrum by doing uh, a Fourier transform to get what's called a transfer function. And then by scaling the transfer function, we can get a power spectrum. We would typically then integrate across a range of frequencies in that power spectrum. So here, uh, excuse me, so here, say we're looking at a seven to 13 or eight to 12 Hertz alpha band. And by collapsing within this range, we can get an estimate of the spatial structure and network connectivity. This is a very powerful method. It's very effective and it, and it definitely works. But unfortunately you can see, we've had to make some assumptions about where the uh, band of interest is going to be. And we're also dealing with a smooth power spectrum. So identifying kind of points of interest and inflections in this power spectrum can sometimes be tricky. So my method is going to suggest that there's uh, potentially another way. So rather than doing this Fourier transform of the autoregressive parameters, we can rather do an eigenvalue decomposition. And that allows us to write a different form of power spectrum. This one being a summation across the MP eigenvalues in our decomposition. And this is kind of neat because once, now that we have this summation, 
we can choose which modes we're going to look at at any, any individual point in time. We don't have to look at the entire system. We can limit ourselves only to look at, say, uh, the most interesting or the most relevant or the most significant modes. So to break this down a little bit, this equivalent form of the uh, transfer function has this parameter r, which is derived from the eigenvectors of our PCA or eigenvalue decomposition. These eigenvectors define a network structure. So for each R, we have an N by N matrix defining a set of network connectivity and whose diagonal describes network topology across the brain. So this gives us our structure and we have a different structure for each mode in our decomposition. From the eigenvalues, uh, lambda, we can get two other param parameters. And these are the peak frequency of an oscillation and the damping time of an oscillation. So peak frequency is, as, as we would normally expect, the amount of time it takes a cycling signal to repeat. The damping time is, is potentially a bit more interesting. So this is telling us how quickly an oscillation will return to zero. So if we uh, have this system and an oscillation begins, how quickly will that oscillation return back to zero if left alone? So we have each of these parameters from each of our modes in our decomposition. So what I would propose is that rather than integrating across a priori frequency bands, rather we can look at the distribution and composition of these parameters, which fall out of the eigenvalue decomposition. So to give you an idea how that might look, we applied this to the HCP MEG data using a really standard pre-processing pipeline. So we took the pre-processed data from the HCP, did some beamforming, applied a parcellation, did an orthogonalization to remove source leakage, and then an MVAR model to describe what's happening in the time series. If we do the standard Fourier approach, we get a nice power spectrum with a clear alpha peak. And by integrating across these frequency bands, we see that we get a set of pretty sensible networks. Mostly, of most interest is occipital alpha and sensory motor beta come out really cleanly. But again, this is with the smooth spectrum and making some assumptions about which frequencies we're gonna be interested in. If we look at the parameters of the modal decomposition, we get a complementary but a, a different perspective. So here we have four participants, each with a different power spectrum. So each line in these power spectrum comes from a different brain region. We see we get a prominent alpha peak in each of these four. If we look at the uh, eigenmodes of this same model, so it's the same information just expressed differently through this equivalent decomposition with peak frequency on X and damping time on Y, we can see that most of the modes are really have are very strongly damped. They return to zero very quickly and aren't of great interest. But where there are relatively undamped modes, these correspond precisely to the peaks in the power spectrum that we've estimated from our, using our standard technique. So here we've got a, some peaks just above 10 Hertz. Um, and this participant is just below 10 Hertz. This participant has a smaller peak uh, and this corresponds to relatively uh, shorter damping times in the uh, eigenvalues. So the neat thing about this is because we have point estimates, we know exactly where all our oscill oscillations are occurring in frequency. We don't have to integrate across any frequency bands. We don't have to find inflection points in power spectra. We just get point estimates of where an oscillation exists. So we can also reconstruct a power spectrum just by taking these long modes. So some of these modes are highlighted in red and they are deemed significant by a non-parametric permutation scheme we came up with. If we reconstruct the spectrum from all modes, we get um, this kind of normal familiar looking uh, peak. But if we restrict ourselves to just look at these significant ones, we really isolate these alpha oscillations really cleanly. And the nice thing is that by recon this reconstruction, follows changes in the peak frequency and amplitude of these different participants naturally, again, without any assumption about frequency bands. We can do the same trick with the spatial distributions. So if we reconstruct spatial maps just from the red or the significant modes, we can see firstly that these alpha networks do localize nicely to occipital and parietal cortex. But importantly, these significant uh, eigenmodes also capture individual variability in spatial, in spatial distribution. Participant one has a really tight occipital distribution, whereas participant three has quite a um, much widespread uh, occipital and parietal distribution. So uh, I think this is quite a, quite a neat way of exploring the oscillations and the, their structure within a data set. 
and hopefully go some way to answering this kind of first question that we asked of how can we deal with, how can we extract spatial and spectral variability at the same time? So by doing this decomposition, we're able to get um, both estimates per participant and then investigate them as we, as we see fit. We haven't had to impose any structure. So if we look at this at a group level, across 78 participants, we now have hundreds and hundreds of modes that come out significant. And these band really uh, predominantly within this alpha range. At the group level, it looks like our a priori alpha band might, might be reasonable. But if we stretch this out um, and look at each participant individually, so here we have all the surviving modes where each participant is in a separate row and frequency on X, we can see that some participants have modes really close to the lower end of a standard alpha range and some really close to the high end of an alpha range. And these participants, the, if we impose structure, we would end up distorting the power spectrum. But from the parameters of our decomposition, we can uh, see and quantify this variability really naturally. Uh, small participants, a small proportion of participants have really no alpha peak. And in those cases, we see no modes surviving in that alpha band. We can also look at the spatial structure. So if we take our uh, spatial maps from each of our modes and do a big PCA across those spatial maps. So we're looking to ask what are the components of spatial variability in our networks across our modes? The first component that comes out is maybe not so exciting that we get a mean power component, um, tightly localized in occipital cortex, which is as we would expect from the predominantly alpha signals that we're seeing. The second component is a bit more interesting that here we have an occipital parietal gradient suggesting that some components have really high um, occipital power and some have really high uh, parietal power. The interesting thing about this is that this spatial variability also has a, free, ha has a correlation with frequency. So a more negative score here indicates a more parietal mode and more, these more parietal modes tend to have a lower frequency than the, than the um, equivalent modes with high occipital power. So that's saying that parietal alpha tends to be lower frequency than occipital alpha at the group level. Importantly, th though this is a significant distinction, it, these distributions are really overlapping. And there's a lot of uh, frequency range where it's really unclear whether we'd be looking at low frequency parietal or high frequency occipital alpha. So if we stretch this distribution out again and look at each individual participant, we can see a little better what's happening. That within an individual scan, most of the time, the occipital component, sorry, the parietal component is lower frequency than the occipital component. However, the difference between occipital and parietal alpha uh, within a participant tends to be smaller than the overall variability in alpha peak frequency across participants. And this means that these two effects are kind of mixed together. At 10 hertz, we might be looking at a low frequency parietal or a high frequency occipital alpha. And in this case, we can see uh, using our method that we're able to disentangle these. So it just leaves me to say that our meta-analysis was performed using the OBA software library, which you can find some more information about here. And the connectivity and spectrum analysis were all done using the sales spectrum analysis and linear systems toolbox. So as a big thank you to my collaborators, Mark Hammers and Gary Green, uh, and to you for your time and attention. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, are there any questions? If you have questions, post them in the Q&A uh, now. Maybe I'll start with a very short one. Um, so you showed that you can then also reconstruct a frequency spectrum uh, from, your, from your points. And mm -hmm. uh, how does that relate to the well, traditional frequency spectrum you showed? Because they, they looked a bit uh, different. Can uh, uh, is there complementary information in there? Or the, yeah. So in the in the in relation to the transfer function, which is very similar to the um, frequency spectrum, but a little bit different, um, the two methods are exactly equivalent. So if you compute using the Fourier transform or the modal transform and include everything, then they, it's exactly the same information. In the power spectrum, they're very very similar, but not not quite analytically identical. So uh, there might be a slightly different, um, uh, often there might be a bit of structure that looks different because we're removing a lot of background modes. So often it sees that 
not many, not much one over F structure survives in the modal decomposition, for instance. Um, I think in terms of interpretation of the signal, so that they're really comparable. So you can, it's still the proportion of power at this given frequency. Um, uh, but, but sometimes the spectrum will look a little bit different because we're subtracting all these other things away at the same time. Yeah, so, so you're basically, you, well, the important part stays, but you uh, throw away some of the less important. Um, yeah. yeah, potentially. Yeah. Well, um great so um there's no question from the audience and we're also uh already uh, quite late so uh thanks again andrew thanks uh Irene, thanks katarina for three very